ChatGPT, the newest sensation of the world, the AI so powerful that it can literally answer anything. And today we're going to ask it, what is the most beautiful chess game of all time? See what happens. See what happens. This is in real time. I'm doing this live. Beauty, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So it is difficult to say which game is the most beautiful of all time. They all have many beautiful chess games played over the years. And different people may have different opinions on which game is the most beautiful. Subjective. I get it. Though, some of the most famous and aesthetically pleasing chess games in history include The Immortal Game by Adolf Anderson and Lionel Kierzycki, and the evergreen game between Adolf Anderson and Jean Dufresne, and the game of the century between Donald Byrne and Bobby Fischer. So the chess AI gave us three world-class chess games that we're gonna see here today. I'm gonna touch very briefly on each of them all, and yeah, I hope you enjoy. Starting off with game number one, The Immortal Game. This was a casual game played in 1851, but little did they know, these players would go on to play one of the craziest and most beautiful games in history. So this game of chess started off very unconventionally. A king moving out uh, on move three, um, this knight moving three times in the opening. Not exactly modern chess, right? Very, very unconventional. This was a type of chess called romantic chess back in the day, as this was played in the 19th century. Romantic chess kind of evaporated in the late 19th century, like towards the 1890s and stuff like that. Giving pieces like crazy, gave up a bishop here on b5. <laughs> Just don't ask, don't ask. So we give up a bishop for space and time, and here we take back a pawn on f4 with tempo on the queen. Queen needs to move, and here knight c3. And as you can see, white has such a beautiful and, and vast amount of space and development and center control for this bishop that you know what it's not that bad we're seeing that white is favored here in this position says the engine so here bishop c5 attacking a rook you know what attacking the queen first you must respond with a queen move here queen takes b2 before taking this rook but now white finds himself in a little bit of danger you see we've piled up the threats against us and we need to hedge our bets here but anderson what does he do Bishop d6, completely out of the ordinary. You're supposed to respond to threats in chess, right? This is what you were taught from the first game you've ever played. But no, Mr. Adolf Anderson does bishop d6 here. And it's interesting. Uh, if queen takes a1, I think he would plan on doing king e2. And if queen takes, the same trick as in the game would arise. Uh, so Adolf Anderson's opponent, Lionel Kierzycki? Kierzycki, I think he was Russian or he was German. Uh, took on g1 and now e5. The reason you play e5, it's very interesting, you're actually covering the defense of this queen on the g7 square that we're threatening with this knight. And his opponent doesn't care about that, it's just like a little move, a little move, a little some some. So his opponent takes on a1 with check, getting a second rook up. Just to give you some perspective here, we are down a full bishop on b5 that was given earlier, a uh, one rook on g1, and now another rook on a1, and we're saving our bishop on g1. So material-wise, we're completely, everything's out the window. No more rules, it's done. Dunzo, king e2, king's in the center, <laughs> bond cloud on move 20, why not? Knight a6, I think black were just running out of creative options at this point. <laughs> not my professional opinion right there. And here, white lays out with you have so many pieces left. You have four pieces left. You have your king. Your king is going to start participating into the attack. No, right? But white comes in with knight takes g7. This is a this is an okay move, a relative move. It does check, right? Forces a king to d8. It's not bad. Taking a pawn, good. King d8. And here, <laughs> queen f6 was played. Wow. This, this is the epitome of chess. It's like, I can give you everything that I own, but if you just give me a few pieces left, enough to make checkmate, it's all worth the entire game, all for me. Crazy. Queen f6 is a queen sacrifice that forces this next black response. Knight takes f6. There are no other moves. This king is otherwise in a mating net. And so after knight takes f6, we just lay the mate bishop e7 checkmate. A beautiful mate that uses every piece at least once. This knight is used twice 
to take out that c7 square, defend the bishop on e7. This knight on g7, very important now, taking up that square on e8. And this bishop, of course, doing the crucial checkmate. And black is up. One, two, three pieces. Four pieces. No, four pieces. Two rooks, a queen, and a bishop. They're up. Quick maths. 22 points on the white pieces, but they have still lost the game. If this isn't one of the greatest games of all time, I don't know what is. Show me something better, and I will say no in advance. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Look at this. The second game we have here recommended by the AI chat GPT is Anderson against Dufresne, played one year after the last game I showed you. Reckon, this is the three greatest chess games in history, and two of them, recommended by the AI, are back-to-back -back in years. This was played in Berlin in 1852, and our goat, Adolf Anderson, has the white pieces here. He's goated. I mean, if you're in two of the three greatest games of all time, you're, you're, just, in, you're just in the S tier right there. So here we have a bit of a more conventional opening. This opening is closed today, pretty much. It's still played. Uh, Gary Kasparov played this a lot. It is called the Evans Gambit. Uh, basically, we give a pawn on b4 for some tempo, for some initiative here, and takes castles, and then you see white, once again, just like in the last game, has a lot of, of energy built up, and the black pieces have only developed two pieces, cannot castle next turn. And you'll see this will be a common factor uh, in these two games, that the king just does nothing all game. Queen b3 threatening on f7 here, Queen f6 to defend, e5, and queen g6. And here, if you think about taking on e5 and you think you're smart, my boy's wicked smart. No, rook e1, and now this knight is pinned, attacking this knight, must defend with a pawn, d6, and here, bishop g5, another tempo move on this queen. If your queen wants to keep defending this knight, queen must go to f5 here, and now we have knight takes e5, d takes, this is all forced, Queen b5 check, little forksies, and adding on pressure to this e5 pawn, everything is blowing up now. If queen d7, rook takes e5 check, king f8, queen c5, and then just eventually here you'll have to give up uh, some, some form of big huge material because I'm taking here on e7, threatening some discoveries, threatening some discovery checkmates just to give you an, indi an indication. Queen g4, we have double check here. King takes his force and we have checkmate on e7. So Jean Dufresne, the Frenchman playing Adolf Anderson, plays queen g6. Having seen that, like mad respect, rook e1, knight g e7, finally developing this knight, threatening to castle next move. King safety, big theme. Bishop a3, Dufresne has to castle here, getting his king to safety, did not do it, plays b5 here. And the reason why, I think, is just to like increase the activity of his pieces. After queen takes b5, drinking the Kool-Aid, rook b8 attacking the queen, and now queen a4 by Anderson. Bishop b6, and you could argue, okay, the black pieces are getting something going here. Like, there's gonna be an attack here with a bishop on b7. Fianchetto, and we get things started, but now knight d2, bishop b7, and knight e4. Kind of blocking the x-ray of this bishop going towards g2, and here queen f5. And in this position, we play bishop takes d3, threatening knight d6, discovery check, winning the queen here, right? Queen h5, another tempo move on the queen, very, very common theme at this point, and now knight f6, check. This mimics a royal fork of the sorts, forcing g takes f6. It's forced. If you move your king, if you do anything else, I take the queen for free. So you have to take it. e takes f6. Now triple discovery onto this knight, right? This pawn is saying is a big surprise. We're opening a file directly on this king. This is a missile headed straight for the king's head. And now rook g8. I think black are think they have some things brewing here. Threatening queen takes f3, to be fair. Rook d1, they do take the bait on f3, threatening checkmate in one. And here, potentially one of the greatest combination, multi-factor, multi-level, multi-variation combinations happens here. Rook takes e7 check. This is nothing. This is just like the little um, sundae on the ice cream, the little bowl that holds the sundae, and the cherry is coming. So we have the bowl now that's laid out. Knight takes e7, and now queen takes d7 check, like a symphony. Perfect. This is the ice cream. This is like why you're here to see this game. This is the three scoops. Give me the full vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. King takes, accepting essentially to take the queen. Now we've sacked a rook 
and a queen and a knight on f6 as well. Bishop f5. This is a double check on the king. And look at where the king can go now. The king can't go to c8 because of this bishop. New thing. Can't go to d8 because of this rook here. This rook that is, mind you, threatened by this queen. The only reason that white is still in the initiative is that this is a double check. Double check forces the opponent's king to move, bar none, no, no, no negotiation, right? Because otherwise, like, the queen can take any of these checkers, right? <laughs> I just invented a chess word right there. So the king can still go to e e8 and still go to c6. In the game, the king went to e8. If you go to c6, I have potentially one of the greatest checkmates I've ever seen, bishop d7 checkmate. Look at these two bishops, like this is some noth nothing, I have no words, no words, you just leave it to the eyes of the beholder. King e8 was played, bishop d7 check, forcing king either to d8 or king to f8, and here king f8, it really doesn't matter, same move on the next turn, bishop takes e7, checkmate, and once again, Adolf, 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 Adolf. God, how many pieces are we down? A queen and a rook? And you're checkmating like this? Crime against humanity. And finally, the final game recommended by chat GPT, the AI for the most beautiful chess game of all time is played by none other than the only American world chess champion ever, Bobby Fischer, AKA Robert James Fischer from the USA. And this was played in 1956. Fisher was 13 years old. Redren, at 13 years old, I was like 1400. My guy is beating one of the best American chess players at the time. And here, the game really starts at Queen A3. Uh, Bobby Fisher with the black pieces, mind you. This was one of the greatest games was played with the black pieces. I love that, I love that. Knight takes E4, Bishop takes E7, forking two pieces. And here, Queen B6. Queen b6, okay, you're giving up the exchange, but at the same time, we have a ton of compensation. Let's say you were to take on f8. I have bishop takes f8, queen must move, right? Queen b3, and now we have rook e8, and just, again, missile on the king straight to you, dunzo. So you can't really take this queen here because that's not gonna be too good because you're gonna be left with some bad atrocities here. Let's say you try to cover this lane here. I go knight takes c3, double attacking this. And it's just so hard to defend. Rook d2, bishop b4, ggs, okay? The bishop is gonna just target this. If you castle, if you ever wanna castle, I have this check here, winning a piece, discovery on this rook, it's over. Look at the abundance of material we have up. At a grandmaster level, this is done. So Donald doesn't take the rook on f8 and plays bishop c4. Nice development move, preparing to castle. All three of these games, the correlation is that the white pieces have not castled. That's like a crazy thing that we're observing. Knight takes c3, okay? If you take this knight, it's a, it's a peace sacrifice. We have rook a8 attacking this bishop and really most likely winning back this bishop. If you're that serious about keeping it, I have bad news for you. We are outnumbering you at least three to one. This bishop on f6 is coming as well. So this is gonna be a bad look here and you're gonna lose some material. I'm gonna be up a couple pawns. So then Donald Byrne rebuttals with bishop c5 attacking a higher value piece in the queen on b6. Not bad, but then he didn't expect that Fisher would play one of the most outrageous moves I have ever seen in my life. I remember analyzing this in uh, My Most Memorable Games by Bobby Fischer when I was like 12 years old and I couldn't believe this game. I, from the book, I was playing around with it and I, and I really, I really thought the entire time that this game was winning uh, for the white pieces. I was rooting for the white pieces. I was such in disbelief, such in disillusion about this rook e8 check, king here, and then bishop e6. What? You just sacked the queen? for virtually like attacking a bishop? What is this? What are you doing? And this is where it's very beautiful because now Donald Byrne, thank God, accepted the queen's sacrifice and let this game unfold. We take one bishop on c4 for the queen, right? The king goes here and you have an option. You could just do a perpetual here and be completely fine with life, right? Here, move here, just do a perpetual check. This would result in a draw. But Bobby Fischer decides to go for the entire bag. This is what I love about Fischer. He famously does not like draws. So he's going knight e2, knight back to c3, 
and then takes this bishop, so now we're at two bishops for the queen, attacking this queen on tempo, and now the knight is defended because Fisher took this pawn here on e4, very important and critical moment of the game. And so now we attack this queen, attacking this rook, queen must move, attacking our bishop, and now we go rook a4 to save our bishop, keep up with the tempo. This is the two big things we're seeing from the greatest games in history, is tempo and making your opponent's king not castle, the biggest things by far. And also a rook against the king, missile on the king for sure. So the queen must move once again, and now we have a rook. So let me just paint the picture here. We have compensation, this is called. The word is compensation for a heavy piece of material. So the compensation we have here is a rook and a bishop pair for the queen. Okay, so queen is worth nine, bishop pair is worth six, rook is worth uh, five. The bishop pair is actually worth seven, um, which Gary Kasparov actually said himself. So bishop pair and rook, that is 11 versus nine so let's see how that pans out for the black pieces on paper the black pieces are winning but this is where it's beautiful how he wraps this up is absolutely world class so we get a system in which we have three pieces and we're trying to really go on these weaknesses and concretize this advantage right we also have another advantage these two pass pawns and this is going to weigh over the queen because the queen is the only very mobile piece that's going to be in charge of defending against these pawn pushes h4 here h5 solidifying a nice g4 square and also blocking in this king this king cannot like go anywhere outside and you'll see that this king is actually much more restrained than we than it looks right knight e5 and now king g7 king g1 bishop c5 so this king g7 was not just like a king move okay we're just gonna wait and wait till my opponent does a blunder no this is gm level so the king move is to get the bishop out of this pin so we can have a fourth participant into the attack king f1 and now we have knight g3 and this is all forced by the way the king can't go anywhere can't go up can't go to the left because of this new bishop in. So the king goes to e1, bishop b4 check, king d1, right, all forced, can't go to f1, can't go up anywhere, king d1, bishop b3 check, look at this, the bishop from previously takes up this e1 square, this new bishop takes up this d1 square, forces the king to go one more, so the king has literally done a salsa dance to the c1 square. Knight e2 check, again, this bishop taking up this d1 square. This bishop is now free here on b4, can do whatever it wants. This knight taking up the c1 square, forcing the king once more to complete the salsa dance. And now we have knight c3. You know what? You go back on your moves all the time in salsa. King c1, all forced once again. And now you have a choice. You could go bishop a3, rook c2, checkmate. What a beautiful checkmate. This bishop is defending this rook. This rook is outlaying the, che the check on the king, and this knight is taking out the two most critical exit squares for the king. And this is one of the most beautiful chess games because all the little soldiers, all the minor pieces, are working together against a queen and a knight. And this was played at the age of 13 years old by Bobby Fischer. 13 and you're playing this genius, creative genius on the board. And that is AI's most beautiful games that it finds are the most beautiful games, the top three ever in the world. What we learned from this, use tempo for you on your opponent, attack heavy pieces. Number two, keep your opponent's king in the center as much as possible. The tempo will help to do number two. And then number three, is bring a rook or bring bishops alongside attacking, targeting that king in the center to create more weaknesses and more tempo for yourself. And those three games sum up the three most beautiful chess games ever played. I hope you enjoyed this video. See you next time.